Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church. We're glad you're here, and wherever you are, and whatever you're doing, whatever time of the day it is, we know that God is with us. And if you are someone who may not regularly be able to attend our church when we are not in a pandemic, we invite you to let us know that you're watching us. And so if you would please call the church office number or write an email to the email address on the screen, we would love to hear from you. And you can also write a comment, and we hope that we can provide the spiritual care and connection that we all need and crave. And now let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to this Bach prelude. to worship is from uh, Psalm 19, which, is encour which encourages us to know God's law and commandments. Will you please join me as we read responsively verses 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can understand one's own errors? Cleanse me from hidden faults. Also keep your servant from the insolent. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Our hymn of praise was uh, probably written in the late 1700s. We're not sure who, who wrote the, at least the first two stanzas, but this is a familiar tune. So please join me as we sing together, Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him.
From 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided, through the foolishness of our proclamation, to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. prayer time, I invite you to let us know when there are opportunities that you would like us to pray in your life, whether they be joys or concerns. Please call the church office or email us so that we can include you in our prayers because we know that they are powerful and we want to support you in our prayers. If you would like to be part of a prayer chain, we are hoping to start that up and strengthen that. And so also, please let the church office know if you would like to be part of that so we can set that up again and really get our congregation to be a people of prayer. Let us pray now for one another. Gracious God, we thank you for this time of Lent in which we find ourselves feeling both a sense of, of self-reflection and repentance, but also renewal. We thank you, Lord, that our hearts are being warmed just as the sun is starting to come out more and longer and the ground is thawing and the snow is giving way to new life. We pray, Lord, for all of those 
who are experiencing both renewal as well as repentance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up before you those who are hurting, whether they be recovering from an illness or surgery or recovering from grief or heartbreak or heartache of any kind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up all, Lord, who are trying to discern next steps, who are trying to figure out plans for themselves, for their families, and even for our church as we look to be faithful in everything that we do. May it be done according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us pray with the confidence as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our despises as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the scripture Mike read, he said that the cross is the power and the wisdom of God. And so we sing, now sing about the cross as we sing together the old rugged cross.
The Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. What are the first pictures that come to your mind when you hear the word cleansing? I imagine fresh smelling bubbles, a sparkling clean shower tub with strong water pressure, and a crystal clear waterfall. But if you've had a colonoscopy, sorted through a loved one's home that became unsafe due to hoarding, or struggling with a tangled mess of emotions in the midst of a tumultuous time, the word cleansing may also be connected to frustration, pain, and tears. It's quite similar to our first thoughts about Jesus. We think of all of his loving, kind, gentle, and forgiving characteristics. But then we're jolted by today's lesson in John 2. The story is often called the cleansing of the temple. But it is not a gentle rain rinsing away the dust, or even a pressure washer scouring out the mildew. Jesus makes a whip scatters animals, tosses around money, turns over tables and yells at the merchants. It sounds less like a cleansing of the temple and more like a temple tantrum. If I were on the scene, I wonder if my training in de-escalation techniques would come in handy. Would it help to maintain a, a non-anxious presence? Would I tell him that his actions will confuse people and frustrate their faith for millennia to come? Those techniques may be relevant for everyone from toddlers to terrorists, but it's probably better to simply quiet our own frightened reactions and listen to the message that Jesus is saying in actions and words. Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Now, to be honest, the first part reminds me of my own cleaning techniques. From a young age, I was very eager to take things out of here by gathering up anything resembling clutter, putting it in boxes, and dumping on whoever's bed I suspected it belonged to. But I doubt Jesus was struggling with issues of control like I have. Jesus was grieved to see what is supposed to be a house of prayer turned into a plaza of prophets. As Jesus' disciples stood back and watched all this unfold, Psalm 69, 9 resounded in their hearts. For zeal for your house has consumed me. At first glance, Jesus seems to be coming unhinged. But as we tune in to listen more clearly, we hear Jesus really saying, I am passionate about fulfilling and helping you fulfill God's purpose. Don't settle for any form of faith that, that denies God's power. Be willing to let me clear away anything that gets between me and you. Those who benefited from trading at the temple became defensive and guarded. What sign can you show us for doing this, they ask. It's no coincidence that these Jewish leaders, many of whom fought to preserve the status quo, much like we Christians do today, asked for a sign. 
Our first reading from 1 Corinthians 1.22 says, For Jews demand a sign, and Greeks desire wisdom. Well, as long as miracles benefited and did not threaten them, people in the Jewish culture valued them as a sign that God was speaking through a prophet. Well, likewise, people in Greek and Roman cultures valued learning and wisdom as the mark of someone worth listening to. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Jesus comes away and cleanses away all the assumptions. God tosses out many of the things this world says are valuable. Jesus overturns the value systems of our cultures and drives away our methods of self-preservation and self-promotion. His own life was the ultimate example of that. Jesus could have miraculously saved himself, but that wouldn't accomplish the need to save humanity. Jesus could have used the infinite wisdom to enlighten the world, but more knowledge doesn't lead to more love. Even though the miraculous signs and wise teachings of Jesus exceed any other person in history, those alone could never save us. Instead, Jesus explains that his death and resurrection will be the source of our hope. When he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? Well, let me give you an example. Last week, I was grocery shopping with my kids, and they said we needed to get mozzarella sticks. So I started pushing the cart down the aisle towards the dairy section, and they kept insisting that we go back to the frozen food section. Well, I finally got to the cheese section to prove to them that the mozzarella sticks were right there and they could pick out how many they wanted. Well, they protested and said, those aren't mozzarella sticks, that's string cheese. We need the mozzarella sticks, the kind you bake in the toaster oven. Well, just as my kids and I were clearly using the same word but thinking different things, Jesus is referring to himself as the temple, and the Jewish leaders are referring to a building as the temple. But in verse 21, it explains... But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. The temple building was a temporary form of God's presence. But Jesus is the exact and eternal presence of God with us. Emmanuel. All of that is far beyond human comprehension. It seems like foolishness that God intends to gather and be present with us, not necessarily in a building, but gathered to Jesus as the body of Christ. It seems like insanity that God would offer his life of love and grace to people who will torture and kill him out of fear and greed. After all, death by crucifixion was reserved for the lowliest of slaves and servants who supposedly committed the most egregious of crimes. Well, much like how Jesus cleansed the temple by tearing it apart, In 1 Corinthians 1.19, the Apostle Paul quotes Isaiah 29.14. I will again do amazing things with this people, shocking and amazing. The wisdom of their wise shall perish, and the discernment of the discerning shall be hidden. In other words, God will cleanse away the pride that that comes from our human-centered power and our discernment, The Holy Spirit will wash away our self-sufficient pride. As Eugene Peterson translates today's call to worship from Psalm 19, 11 to 13, God's word warns us of danger and directs us to hidden treasure. Otherwise, how will we find our way or know when we play the fool? Clean the slate, God, so we can start the day fresh. Keep me from stupid sins, from thinking I can take over your work. Then I can start this day, sun-washed, scrubbed clean of the grime of sin. We may unknowingly play the fool ourselves. Perhaps this past year has been cleansing us from a foolish idea that our church was based in a building rather than lived as Christ's body. 
Maybe we're being cleansed from assuming that influential jobs are better and becoming more grateful for essential workers who labor long, hard, and risky hours to keep us healthy, fed, clean, taught, and safe. Unlike the signs for Jews and wisdom for Greeks, may this year of cleansing help us see signs of grace and wisdom in the so-called foolishness of God. As 1 John 1, 7 reminds us, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's counterintuitive, but that's how being a fool for Christ works. Blood that normally stains now washes away our sins. A cross that symbolizes death, the death penalty, now becomes a sign of eternal life. A holy place of worship is recentered on the Holy One we worship. Please pray with me. Lord, we ask for your cleansing that forgives, saves, and makes us new. We release everything that gets between us and Christ and me and others. Gather us to Jesus, our temple, and help us to die to self and find new life in Christ. Amen. We have many ways of finding that new life and engaging with one another as the body of Christ, his temple. A few of those include meeting on Zoom and Bible studies. Anytime you are interested, you are always welcome to join for a Wednesday Zoom meeting at 6 o'clock, as well as a Sunday morning one at 9 o'clock. And if you would like those um, Zoom links, please email me or the church office, and we will get those to you right away. Also, um, to celebrate Holy Week and Easter, we have two special events coming up. On Good Friday, we will have Stations of the Cross set up for people to come through at their own time and pace. It will be open on Good Friday, that's April 2nd, from 4 to 6 p.m. And as you come in the door by the parking lot in the BK Smith room, there will be stations set up all the way down the hallway looking out the courtyard, all the way through the John Wesley room, and all the way up through the center of the sanctuary leading us to the cross. And then on Easter Sunday, we'll be having a drive-in communion service at 10 o'clock, and we are excited to have very special music, and we invite you to join us in celebration. And to give you a preview, it is likely that we will be opening our church pending approval and ongoing uh, benefits from the recent vaccinations that have been happening we will be hopefully opening for worship uh, later on in April, and more information will be coming to you soon. We also want to celebrate the lives among us and the birthdays happening this week. And so please um, say and share a happy birthday with Diane and Carly, London, um, Dan uh, MZ, if you know who that is, and C, Dan M. G., if you can figure that out, and Roger M. We are refraining from using your whole last names out of safety and security reasons. And now I invite you to sing with us our closing hymn, number 365, Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
I send you forth. Knowing that God's grace fills you, cleanses you, washes over you, empowers you to live lives that are renewed in Christ and based and gathered as his body, the temple of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.